Check, check, one, two. Check, check. Check, check, one, two. Check. Check one, two. Check. Check one, two.
that's important is that this, this is the microphone. So don't mess with it, okay? Don't mess with the mic. And the, to the best of your ability without, you know, worrying about it too much, it's good not to turn your back too much to the mic. I don't, I didn't notice anybody yesterday during practice looking at the screen too much, so I think you'll be fine, but just be aware that, I mean, there's your audience, so if you just be aware of that audience, you'll be fine mic-wise. Also, don't bonk that, because it's probably bothering the people who are trying to watch. Right.
For you to leave the background lights on or off? Oh, no, that's all Turn it off. Turn it off and let him look and see. Oh, it's right there. I'm not live, am I? That would be embarrassing. Only, only live in front of you. I think you're actually live. Technically, we're not supposed to open that, but. When we won't be able to see the students, if they What if we shine? What if we shine? It has about a 30 to 45 second delay, I think. I've got a. I don't know. I have a cell phone. I just can't operate mine. Okay. Stand right here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what There's this does when it moves. Them. When it moves me over, it's just a little delayed right there. About Forty seconds, I think. It actually does help. I think that's fine. Yeah. What do you think? I don't yeah. know. I'd rather them see the students than the slides super clearly. But. Okay. Well, then turn, just turn on the lights. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The audience wants to see the students. Right. That's true. Okay. Not that. <laughs> you know, okay. If it was like, oh okay. <laughs> you know Your mom I mean. just texted me and said, yes, you're live. <laughs> yes, you're live. <laughs> Yes, they can see you. Stop being. This is when it's awkward when you know parents of the scholars, right? <laughs> Do you want me to take? Say, yeah, I have a feeling she's not getting off until you. Do you have a charger? My battery is. I mean, with the lights on, you can see it, but that's fine. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. I think we'll just go there. Do you, are you giving up battery? Oh, I doubt it. Should we ask somebody in the back? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah.
guys. Thank you for joining us on this busy, busy day before the start of the semester. Uh, d projected here is uh, the class, the 2018 class of Scott Science Scholars. This is our sixth cohort. Uh, what a way they have come uh, from an awkward first day when they were scared and timid about everything into now you're going to see uh, these really incredibly polished presentations for students who are not even college freshmen yet officially. So a uh, really impressive group that we've had. Uh, they have worked so hard uh, over the past three weeks. They've had such great attitudes about it. Probably, uh, probably our easiest class in terms of personalities and kind of the, uh, the soft conflicts and issues that you jump into when you have three, you know, three weeks of living together, doing a lot of intense activity. And they put up with um, a lot of additional chaos this year because our program bumped up against orientation and uh, the beginning of sports and athletics practices and whatnot in ways that it has not previously. And so they've had uh, to deal with a lot of schedule changes and schedule pinches, and they've done that with great confidence and stride and great attitudes and have just been really fabulous. And so uh, we thank them for it. Um, we also have a lot of thank yous, and so I'll try to be quick in that, but I want to make sure that, that we thank everybody appropriately. Uh, always the biggest reason that Scott Science Scholars is successful is because of our peer mentors. The peer mentors are the students who are uh, their sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Uh, who are mostly STEM majors, many of whom this year were Scott Science Scholars in previous years, and they returned to be peer mentors to these guys and, and showed them the ropes, quite literally, on the ropes course the first day with Mountain Challenge, um, but to, sh to show them the rope, and they are with them during the day when we are doing science labs, um, math workshops, complicated computer programming and cheering them on and helping them work through the, the hard parts of that. But then they, when Dr. Siopsis and I get to go home at night and hang out with our families and run them to soccer practice and all that good stuff, these guys are there <laughs> cheering them on, keeping them engaged, figuring out who needs space, who needs to be moving, who needs to what. And once the homework starts, they're there policing the homework. And so uh, they are just doing so much work throughout this whole week. I know they're exhausted. Many of them this year also were adding on to their regular duties of peer mentors by being college peer mentors, soccer players, uh, RAs, and doing all that. So it was, it was a lot of work for them. So I just I want to introduce them all really briefly. Miracle Walls, can you, can you, no, you don't want to stand for the <laughs> <laughs> Miracle is a, a rising junior biology major, a former Scott Science Scholars and a Scott Science Scholar. Am I getting it all wrong? No, that's right. Okay. And um, she was, of course, a great peer mentor. Alan Miramontes Flores. Uh, Alan is a rising senior, and he was also an RA this year, and uh, he's a biochem major and uh, finishing his thesis on top of all this. And some of the students got to help him with the thesis projects and do some original research. Uh, so we're grateful for him. Uh, Boomer Russell. Uh, Boomer, a rising senior, a returning Scott Science Scholars. Actually, both Alan and Boomer are returning Scott Science Scholars and returning Scott Science Scholars peer mentors. Uh, Boomer also guided the students through an activity along with Alan. They both taught an activity this semester, and it was an activity that was related to their senior studies. So they got to pull students into real active research that they're working on, and they did a great job with it. Uh, behind Boomer, we have Chris Fernandez. Uh, Chris is a rising junior, is that right? A rising junior math major, major with computer science and stats, majors, minors, on top of all that, and plays soccer and ran with the Bulls this summer, and <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, it, it, Chris, uh, Chris did a lot and was coming back even when he was not officially on duty uh, dur during the, the summer, and so we're really thankful for Chris. And then way back in the back, Angel O'Neill. Angel is a rising junior psychology major, biology minor, um, returning Scott Science Scholar, worked with the students really hard, and um, has, has just done, all the peer mentors have done a really fabulous job for us. Um, and working together with them very closely in the evenings, managing homework, helping keep spirits up, counseling, providing life counsel to all of us all the time. Uh, Lindsay Walton, uh, Scott, or <laughs> 
STEM success center manager extraordinaire and just, yeah, just probably the most important piece of this team. And so this is the Scott Science Scholars Leadership Team. Of course, I have to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Maria Siopsis, calculus professor, um, brainchild behind Scott Science Scholars. So all this craziness is all, it's all because of her. Um, <laughs> and she, we work really closely together. I'm Dr. Angela Gibson, associate professor of chemistry and um, interim chair, but on sabbatical, and Dr. Se Dr. Siopsis is also on sabbatical um, for a, um, interim chair of the Division of Natural Sciences. And so we're on sabbatical. Our sabbatical project is the Scott Science Scholars, and so we will be writing up and analyzing the results for the last six years of Scott Science Scholars, and hopefully, um, well, we already know it works. It keeps students here. It keeps them at Maribel College, and, and we're really happy about that. Um, Lots of other people to thank, and so I want to go through that as well. Um, faculty and staff who are an integral part of this program, helping us up and providing support all along the way. Uh, of course, the president of the college, Tom Bogart, um, who has supported the program every year and continues to support us. Uh, the interim vice president and dean, academic dean of the college, Dan Clingan Smith. Uh, the interim, or not interim, uh, vice president and dean of students, Melanie Tucker. And the assistant dean of students, Kristen Gorley, they work with us really hard in coordinating to make sure that the components of our program work with orientation and all the other things that students need to do to become active students here at Maryville College. Um, the residence life staff worked with us really hard this year, and so we're really grateful to, to all the folks over there. And then, of course, this year we, had, um, we, we needed to work with coaches in different ways than we have had to in previous years, and so special thanks. Uh, to to um, Kendra Schramm and Pepe Fernandez for their for their cooperativity in helping us get the athletes um, in three different places at one time uh, these last couple of days, and we really appreciate that. Um, also, want to thank our faculty. They provide so much help and encouragement to us throughout the years and to our students throughout the years. Uh, but they also jump in and help teach lessons as part of the Scott Science Scholar Summer Experience, and we think that's really important because it gets these students used to what the real academic classroom is going to look like. It gets them used to what that different dynamic is between a professor and a college student compared to a high school teacher and a high school student. And also just maybe takes away a little bit of the fear factor and makes us not look not so intimidating. Um, so thanks to all of those who um, helped with us this year. Um, Professor Guerno led them through an exercise in physics, looking at amusement park physics and optics, and students are going to tell you about that. Dr. Um, Jesse Smith uh, led them through a, a complicated exercise, magic squares and math, and I think you'll hear more about that. Uh, Dr. Drew Crane, biology professor, professor uh, led them through an exercise making mozzarella cheese and learning about the science and chemistry behind that. And then Professor Bob Lowe, Dr. Professor Bob Lowe now, right? <laughs> Just finished his uh, PhD this summer. Um, and he led them through an exercise in computer programming. And so you, you know, we only have seven presentations today, so we don't get to all of the topics. They did a lot more than even this, than even you're going to hear about today or that I've mentioned. Um, so know that they were working really hard, and we selected, uh, we, we let the students select their presentations, and um, they are going to take over now and tell you about what they've learned. So, thank you. So I think up first we have Austin and DJ all about the magic squares. Uh, hello, uh, today we'll be talking about magic squares and who all in here enjoys doing puzzles and you know trying to solve things? That's actually a lot more than I expected. <laughs> uh, as you could probably tell, we do too. That's why we wanted to show everyone here and in the live stream about what we had learned. Um, I'm DJ Cooper. I'm from Maryville, Tennessee. My major is mathematics, and uh, my interests are baseball and math, but not as like individual things, but as like a combined. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Moneyball, uh, it explains how the uh, Oakland A's went from a team that was bottom, absolute worst, all the way up to best in the league using their stats and uh, just personal connections. I'm Austin. I'm also from Maryville, and I'm also majoring in mathematics. Uh, my interests are topology and geometry, so puzzles based on shape are right up my alley. So um, our, what we learned was about magic squares, and the reason why we learned magic squares it's, it's the square of any size. There, 
those are such numbers as they have certain properties. Um, so with this magic square, the what it is is each row will add up to 15. So if you add up each column, it also adds up to 15. And adding up these diagonals right here also gets you 15. Um, along with magic squares, we learn about uh, modular mathematics, which uh, essentially, instead of being just squares, uh, it more encompasses like a circular mathematics. And uh, a Cayley table helps you with um, solving for the numbers in modular mathematics. So um, in the history of magic squares, uh, there are quite a few things. Um, we're only talking about two. This magic square is a four by four magic square, columns and rows adding up to 34. Uh, and it was uh, documented in China in 2800 BC. Uh, and uh, in myth and legend around the same time, there was a uh, flood going. And uh, this Chinese village was being flooded out. Flooded out and uh, in Chinese culture, you'd sacrifice someone to your god. And at that point, because it was flooding, they sacrifice people to the rain god. So every time a flood would come by, this turtle, this one, uh, yeah, uh, would show up and eventually someone like noticed that all these markings were on the back of the turtle. And turtles aren't square, so they, you know, trying to connect that to a magic square. See, if you come up here, there are nine individual dots, which are here, and it correlates to each box. So when like Austin had said, you add up the rows, the columns, and the uh, diagonals, you get 15. And they had, you know, once they realized that, they uh, came to the conclusion that they needed to sacrifice 15 people. So you may have noticed that all these uh, three by three magic squares we had, uh, both of them, were very similar. And that is because in a three by three uh, square using the numbers one through nine, there's only one possible solution, unless you rotate it or completely flip it around. They're essentially the same thing. Um, however, you can't have more than just a three by three. You can also go up to four by four or five by five. And you, in theory, you can go as big as you want, but not all of them have been tested yet, so we're not sure. If you ever want to make an odd uh, numbered magic square, you can use what is known as the staircase method. And what it is, is you just you pick a random spot in the square, it was just picked right here, and you put a one in there up a square and over a square. But you notice that goes up. So a fraction around, but up one and over one. Then you put the two, then you're done with the three, four, five, and you notice you can't go up diagonal up one because there's already something there. So instead you go down and you keep going. If you follow that pattern, you'll eventually draw out the entire square and get a functioning magic square. Um, if you noticed, he had mentioned wrapping around. Um, that's where modular mathematics basically kind of correlates to this. Um, so modular mathematics is, uh, everyone's used a clock before, I'm assuming, because you know what time it is. Um, <laughs> so let's say you go to bed, 11 o'clock at night, sleep for eight hours, really lucky, because this is college, it doesn't happen. <laughs> you wake up at you know, seven in the morning, not 19. <laughs> and uh, so a Cayley table uh, helps with solving for that if you are using larger numbers in this circular pattern. So for instance, this is modular eight. So um, eight and zero are essentially the same number. Um, so if you add you know, zero and two, you get two. Two plus four, you get six. Six plus another four, you don't get 10, you get two. Thank you. crammed them together into that thing. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice there's two numbers in it, and you notice like no number goes above three. That's because we used uh, modular four, so the only allowed numbers were zero, one, and one, two, and three. And so we took the ordered pairs, and you'll notice each ordered pair is unique, so none of them are duplicated. But if you add up like all the first numbers in this column and all the second numbers in this column, and then do the modulus thing to it, you'll get two zero. And that happens with every column and every row, and it took us an hour. 
<laughs> um, but uh, magic squares and uh, mod modular mathematics aren't, you know, just used in math. You, uh, they've actually tried and are working on applying it in modern physics and how atoms work with one another. So if you have uh, atoms of different masses, in this case one to nine, like a magic square, uh, if you can bond them together, and let's say you bump the six up there at the top, because it's on this like spring, it's gonna wiggle around and everything, but due to the uh, order of the numbers and how equal everything happens to be, it eventually just wiggles back to equilibrium actually pretty fast. So if you were gonna scale it up a lot, you would probably use it for like car shocks. Uh, the, the main person you want to thank, my person anyway, <laughs> want to thank Dr. Jesse Smith because he not only taught us all of this, he showed us how it all worked, and stayed with us for that one hour that we were bumbling around on a chalkboard trying to figure out that board. Is that where we start? Okay. Do you want me to do the keys? Yeah. Do you want to stand right here too? We have everyone. So we did our presentation on the TVA dance and how that connects with the Acoli River. My name is Kelly Hernandez and my hometown resides in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm planning to do a double major track which involves international business and chemical engineering. And my interests are what you call Japanese animation or as we call it today, anime. I love that a lot. And I, I do dabble in making jewelry so that's something I also love. I love watching the DYI projects. I love watching HGTV and Food Network. I'm Monica Taylor, and I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I intend to major in biology, and some of my interests include writing and just listening to music. OK, so TVA was founded in 1933, and it was there to help with the severe flooding that occurred in the Tennessee Valley, because that would just ruin the crops. and it was harmful to the people who lived around there, so they wanted to fix that problem. Um, by doing that, they built a series of dams along major rivers. Um, the TVA, they make flood regulation plan based on the possibility of a 100-year flood, which is a flood that has a 1 in a 100 chance of happening in any given year, although it can happen more than once in a year. Um, some valleys also do that based off of a 500-year plan, which um, can happen one in 500 chance in any given year. And um, T TVA, they built their dams based off of PMF, which is probable maximum flood. And that's just a very catastrophic flood that has a very slim chance of happening. But they built their dams based off of that in case it does happen so that they can be prepared. And it's also important to mention that in around 1940, the TVA participated in one of the largest hydroelectric construction programs here in the United States. Um, there's a few cons about the dams. It can't help with all the flooding that happens in the Tennessee Valley, although it does a good job of trying to prevent as much of it as they can. Like, the dam can only have so much water behind it before it can't do much. And also, if the heavy rainfall falls downstream, it doesn't do much. So it has to fall upstream in order for the dam to do its job. So we did what we call a DVA, TVA dam tour, and we were able to see the second Okoye River Dam, and we were able to talk about how the horizontal generators work. 
So some of the sciences behind those horizontal generators is like the mechanics, which involves like its parts and how it's all assembled, how it all works together to make sure it produces electricity by harnessing the power of water. And a little bit of the maintenance part of the TVA is to make sure that every part is working so nothing goes wrong with the generators and essentially make sure it's doing its job. And then training employees is also another important thing because they have to make sure their employees know what they're, do what they're doing, like to make sure that they press the right button so it doesn't all go haywire, and to make sure nothing, well, essentially explodes. So what does the TVA have to do with STEM? So in this picture right here, it shows how the, how the water is actually essentially, well, essentially your main source for the power when it comes to hydroelectric power. So some of the water in the dam, which is where the reservoir is, a, that water gets drawn in through gravity by this pipe called the penstock. And that penstock takes that water to the turbine which helps that turbine turn and helps the generator starts making electricity and running it through currents. And some of that water goes as to tail water and then long distance power lines con connect to that generator in order to collect that electricity and deliver power to the surrounding area. The Okoe River, our guide when we went kayaking explained most of the history when it when it comes to the Koei River. However, it is not all essentially the positives. It's mostly a negative impact that we have on it, especially when it comes to the environment and copper mining that we have done in the past. And some of the sciences of the Koei River is that we were on the water supply for the TVA dam. And mostly for the mathematics part is basically tourism, which a lot of people would like to come there to do a little bit of white water rafting or kayaking. And as Kelly mentioned about the history of the Ocoee, um, copper mining was a big thing that they did there, especially with Native Americans, and it was sort of reintroduced in 1843 by European settlers, and it lasted up until the 1900s. The last copper mine actually was closed in 1987. Um, one of the minerals that they mined was pyrite, and pyrite, when it's exposed to either air or water, it can become chemically unstable, which can be harmful for plants and animals in that area. And although it happens naturally, when you mine it, it makes it a more de devastating process. Um, the water quality wasn't the only thing ruined there. The forests were as well due to trees being chopped down. So what does the Okoro River have to do with STEM? Besides that we were kayaking on the water supply for the TVA dam, we also knew a little bit of the water quality when it comes to algae, con algae growth. And usually there's an environmental scientist with the TVA to make sure that the water quality is at optimal temp temperature and optimal pH to ensure there is no algae growth. And this also impacts people who are in the surrounding area who drink the water. They also have to make sure they test that water in order to make sure it's safe for the drinkable standard. Um, we would like to thank the TVA staff for allowing us to go to their facilities and take a tour and learn more about it. And we'd also like to thank Tyson and Roland for planning this field trip for us. These are our sources. <laughs> Any questions? Pose. Did I do that? Did you do your pose? Cow pose. No. You got it. Do it again. <laughs> All right. Hello. Today we'll be pre presenting on epidemiology. All right. So my name is Brooke Pratchett. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. My major is going to be biology on a pre-vet track, and my interests include reading, algebra, and sleeping. <laughs> I'm in Carl myself. I'm from a small town in Houston Nashville called Fairview, Tennessee. Uh, I'm in I'm gonna be a math major and my hobby
hobbies are cake review, uh, cars, I love Namaste, and fun challenge and all. Alright, so basically what epidemiology is, is the study of the things that cause diseases and the trends that they carry and using that knowledge to try to control the disease and eventually eradicate it. So this is uh, the Center for Disease Control, CDC. They came out with the epidemiologic triangle to explain the concept of it. So the triangle has three points and each point stands for something. So first on the top you have the host. And so the host is what carries the disease and they do not have to show symptoms, but they can <coughs> infect other people or organisms. And then you have the agent, which the agent is the disease. And then you have the environment, which is your external factors like precipitation or temperature, which basically like tells you if the agent's going to thrive or not. And then in the middle, which connects, connects all of them, is time for your organism. And here, <coughs> we have the math behind this. Uh, so I have words, a word chart for the type of words, and then I have some visuals for uh, the next slides. So what we're working with here is three groups. So you have susceptible, you have infected, and recovered. So if you're in susceptible, then you can be infected. If you're infected, then you have the disease. And if you're recovered, then you're immune from it and you can't go back to the uh, other two groups. And how you get to be a susceptible is if you migrate into susceptible, like into the population, uh, and then you subtract the number of new infections to take out of the and then how you get the infected is the number of new infections minus the infected who recover or the infected who die. And the change in recovered is the infected who recover minus the recovered who die. And this is the flow chart that goes with the words. So as you can see, you have births uh, that go up into susceptible to increase the population, but you also have deaths that decreases. And you go from susceptible to spread to infected <clears throat> and if you're infected, you either go to recovery or you exit through uh, death. And if you go to recovery, uh, you either stay in that group until everyone is like immune or uh, vaccinated or you um, die of other causes. And then here's the best part about it, the graph, my favorite part. Uh, <laughs> start out with, so, so these are all your variables that are like the simple variables. So you start out with 1,000 susceptible people, which is your purple line, and you start out with five infected. And these are your rates. So these two are very minimal, but they also play a big role in putting more people in the population or taking out people. And then you also have your infection rate, which is eight out of 10. So that means there's an 80% chance that you will get infected from interactions with another infected person. And then your recovery rate is a 22 out of 10, which means a 20% so as you can see over time, over 1.25 months, the infected, infected peak uh, and your susceptible goes all the way down to its minimum and it'll stay there constant because everyone's infected. And then your infected go from a maximum all the way down to a minimum and then your recovery shoots up to its maximum and then everyone's in equilibrium. Alright, so with epidemiology there are many purposes of this practice, but we named the top three. The first one is to predict the impact of a disease, and you can also find solutions to future diseases by looking at the trends of past diseases, because chances are, if they match the trend, then the way to cure them will be very similar. And it also helps epidemiologists, epidemiologists, statisticians make an accurate assessment of how much the said disease will spread. And how it relates to STEM is that uh, bi different biologists use them to identify the genes and the origins of the disease, and they also come up with the best way to eradicate or cure the disease. So I came up with two examples, the first one being Ebola that everybody knows about. <laughs> what you guys might not know is there were two outbreaks in 1976, and then you know the more common one that everybody knows about in 2014 to 2016. And in those times, they looked Biologists looked at the genes and realized that it was transferred through human-to-human -human contact. And in regions like, and in places like South Sudan and the Democrat, Democratic Republic of the Congo, what they do when someone dies is that they kiss them. And if you have Ebola and you're dead and somebody kisses you, you now have it. And also their hospitals and health clinics weren't 
to the cleanest of standards, which was a really easy way for the virus to spread. So they figured that they to like help the death rate, they would try to get people to stop kissing dead people and clean up their hospitals. And uh, the next one is measles, which is actually one of the leading causes of death among young children. But due to them making a vaccine, vaccine and modifying it, in the years 2000 and 2000, through 2016, there was an 84% drop in deaths. So this is uh, about measles outbreaks, and this isn't like death because of like cases that are just people infected. And, uh, and I thought this was very interesting because the CDC uh, shows you from 2010 to 2018, uh, how many people were infected in that year. And so usually they say between the 50 and 250 range, and measles spikes between those two every year. But for, uh, for, for very specific reason, in 2014, there was a massive spike in cases because an Amish community did not vaccine their children because they're against vaccination. And also, people from the Philippines came over uh, for immigration, and they spread it through that too. And also, what they do is they took all of these cases in the past years, and they predicted uh, 2018, which I think is the coolest thing ever because now you can predict how many cases there will be. And also, this was just yesterday, um, this, but this, we got this today, and it turns out that in Europe, more than 41,000 people in just this year, in six months, were, have been infected, and 37 have died. All right, so we would like to acknowledge Dr. Siopsis because she was presented this and she worked with us to get all the graphs and things right. And these are our sources. Hello everybody, so today we're going to be talking about a past experiment we just did called platelet protein analysis. My name's Abby Frain, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. I plan on being a biochemistry major and some of my interests include anything to do with the outdoors, hiking, kayaking, water polo. My name's Cameron O'Hara, I'm from Long Island, New York. Um, my intended major is neuroscience. I enjoy running sometimes. Um, <laughs> I love volunteering at hospitals and going to the beach. So the main purpose of the platelet protein analysis lab was to determine the molecular weight and purity of a protein, as well as measure the concentration um, of an unknown protein in a solution. So basically, we ran three measurmental processes in order to calculate the stock concentration, which will be explained later. So the first step in this would be to do a SDS page, and we use the protein trim-like transcript one. Um, or TLT one. Uh, this is the protein that we used in our experiment. It is the blood platelet protein activated by thrombin. When released, it's soluble. This is found in um, high concentration with septic patients and those with ARDS. Um, in order to study TLT1, it must be purified. And all of our samples that we used were already purified and went through protein prep. And that's the sequence. So what is SDS page? It's actually an acronym. It stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate, and that's the molecule right there. And then page stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And that is this right here. So the whole purpose of this is to find a specific molecular weight of a protein without knowing it. So how this works is you'll take your protein and you'll insert it into these wells right here, and then you'll run an electrical current through it, and then based on that, the protein itself will stop along the way depending on the molecular mass. And the less it weighs, it's going to go through a lot faster because the lighter it is, it'll kind of come down towards the bottom rather than the top. 
And this is important because it helps us find the stock concentration because we need to know the molar mass in order to calculate that. The Bradford assay is a certain method utilized to determine the total concentration of a protein within a sample. It's based on the proportional binding of Bradford dye to the proteins. Uh, the more proteins that are present, the higher the binds. Because the assay is being colored, the color of the sample becomes darker as the concentration increases. So the reason why we did this and the analysis aspect of it, this is for the SDS page. So this is what our gel looks like after we ran the electrical current. So as you can see on the very top, it's all labeled and those were proteins that have already been used through past experiments. So they've already gone through the purification process. So we were able to use those, although they were unknown to us. And as you can see on the very first, you have the standard. And that's important because it allows us to see all the molecular weights possible for this gel in lab. So we can have a good see as to where each protein would lay. So for example, on the first one, you have TLT1E1. And you can see on the side, it's measured by kilodaltons. And you can see that that specific protein was roughly 15 kilodaltons. And this is calculated to use the weight value to then again find the concentration. And then for the Bradford assay aspect of it, this is the Bradford assay analysis. This right here is the Bradford assay table and plate, and this held all of our diluted proteins. And judging by the color, we're able to see how concentrated it is. So the darker, more royal blue it is, the more concentrated it is due to the Kumasi Brilliant Blue dye we used within the protein. So like you can see up on the top right here, these are a lot darker blue than the ones down here, which kind of have like a green tint to it. So therefore, they obviously don't have a very high protein concentration. And then we dilated all of our samples with water because certain proteins, their concentration is too high for, for them to be able to successfully be on the standard curve, which is what we use to find the concentration, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And so the mathematical part of our um, experiment is, is seen here. This is the Bradford assay. This is our uh, this is our standard curve, and you want your standard curve to be as close to one as possible. And so when you're analyzing the mathematics behind this, we have to first have the standard concentration, which is made up of all of our known values. And through this, we'll use our known dilutions with the water with the ratio being one to 10 in order to create this standard curve right here. And then in order to find the concentration, we're gonna use the mathematical equation Y equals MX plus B, Y being the absorbency and X being the concentration that we're trying to find. And then when we know our absorbance value of it all, we're gonna then take the formula A equals M times C, A being the absorbency and M is the mass, which is what we found using the SDS page for the molecular mass of it all. And then lastly, to get the stock concentration, which is essentially the whole point of this project, is you're gonna take your initial C value, which we found, and multiply it by 10, because again, we diluted the sample with water ratio being one to 10, and we'll successfully get the stock solution. So how does this relate to a real world? Um, this is done in a laboratory by various kinds of scientists. Um, it can represent every letter in STEM, but it emphasizes the S. Um, electrophoresis is often used in forensics, genetics, molecular biology, microbiology, and biochemistry. Um, it can be used to obtain a DNA fingerprint of a criminal, separate DNA and RNA, cloning and genetic engineering, and even diagnose different strains of a virus. Um, we dedicate this entire presentation to Boomer. This is his <laughs> senior thesis. Um, without him, this would not have been possible. So thank you, Boomer. And then here are all our citations.
This will just take a second. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are going to be presenting on pigobacterial transformation. Uh, to introduce myself, I am Josh Campbell. Um, I am from Cookville, Tennessee. I'm planning on majoring in biochem. Uh, my, my interests are soccer, hiking, and being in outdoors in general, and um, being with my friends. to kind of put what she's trying to say into like a picture or like a diagram. We have our plasmid here, with, that is the PEO. And we have the, in this plasmid, the, we have the genes for uh, green fluorescent protein, uh, we have the green fluorescent protein gene and its promoter and the ampicillin resistance. The ampicillin is the antibiotic for the E. coli. And this is the E. coli bacteria. And we want this plasmid to be in the genome of this E. coli. Um, so we have to heat shock the E. coli so the cell membrane gets leaky, so the plasmid can transform into the E. coli, making the genome with the plasmid and the orig original genome of the um, E. coli bacteria. Uh, the purpose of this lab is was to understand the process of bacterial transformation with the aid of plasmids. And also to understand how the expression of genes can actually determine whether or not a genetic transformation was successful. So by going off of that idea of bacterial transformation with the use of plasmids, we first had to, well, not us, but Dr. Gibson had to design the experiment in a way for us to examine
So to reiterate our hypothesis, we predicted that the negative P glow control would grow, but with the with the ampicillin antibiotic, it would not grow. <laughs> but with the with the positive P glow, we did predict since it had the ampicillin resistance gene, it would grow, but and but with the presence of arabinose, it would glow since it's the inductor inducer for green fluorescent protein. And these do show um, the before and after, and again, this data is exactly what Josh and I have been explaining. Um, so this is before incubation, and incubation allows the, pro, uh, the bacteria to become accustomed to acclimate heat shock them and put them through all the trials. And you can see that. <laughs> they got accustomed to their new environment, and that allowed them to properly grow and obtain the results that we were looking for. Um, how does bacterial transformation um, transformation relate to STEM? It can be uh, used to study bacterial and DNA transformations, and for example, and for commercial crops, um, are often used to be genetically modified to have insect resistance and um, so, um, crops like corn and cotton, we see that they often have these resistance genes that have been genetically modified so that insects and herbicides do not affect these crop yields. But something that I did not know and Dr. Houston actually explained to us was that in underdeveloped countries, where rice is a staple crop for them, they are actually genetically modifying it so that they have better carotene, which is an essential vitamin. So it allows them to still be able to make abundant amount of crop yield in rice and get the proper nutrients that they need. And another interesting thing being done with um, genetic transformations is through implants, which is being engineered using recombinant DNA that's actually inserted into common bacteria, just like the E. coli we use in our lab, and then once it's harvested and fermented, it is actually put back into humans to produce it again. Um, we would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Gibson for carrying out this lab, and to both Dr. Siopsis and Dr. Gibson for like helping us through this program, and especially Lindsay Walton for having be her shoulder to cry on. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all of us here mentors um, for being with us 24 hours a day, six days a week, and not going too tired of us. Um, we sincerely thank you all. Good afternoon. Um, today we'll be talking to you guys about aldol condensation and spectroscopy. My name is Kiara McCroskey. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I intend to major in biology and maybe use it for infectious diseases in the future. And I'm also interested in watching taste made, doing makeup, and comparing real and fake news articles. <laughs> My name is Lindsay Van Paris. I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. My major is exercise science, and a few things that I am interested in uh, is golf, working with kids, and then one that's not up there is spending time with my best friend. So a little bit about the project that we are doing is we are using a lab from Dr. Duncan. who He created this lab for us to see spectroscopy results from using different materials. There are five groups that tested with different, um, different substances and predicted results, and then we used that to analyze the results in a spectrometer and look at color analysis. Okay, aldol condensation is an organic chemist, <laughs> a reaction in organic chemistry, which basically is the combination of a benzaldehyde and an acetophenone, which results in a chalcone. 
Uh, benzaldehyde is a colorless fluid that is used as a base ingredient in most perfumes and dyes, and then acetophenones are used in perfumes to give them a nice smell. <laughs> Um, spectroscopy is basically the measurement of the interaction between electromagnetic matter, in this case being light, and matter. Did I say that? Radiation and matter. Okay. So an example of this would be the UV radiation coming from the sun, coming through this and interacting with the matter, which is the prism here, and then we can see the result is a split in different measurements of Okay, so additive mixing is whenever you combine emitted photons to form white light, which is what you see in the lights above you. Um, subtractive mixing is whenever you take white light and you're pulling out specific photons to where you'll see a color that's not, that is on the visible spectrum. So the visible spectrum is over here. Double bonds in molecules um, allow absorbance of wavelengths to, to where you can see the colors. So whenever the wavelength is absorbed, what your eyes are seeing is the color that is the reciprocal of what's being absorbed, which we'll talk about in a second. This formula is the speed of light. Um, when you're trying to find the speed of the light that's being omitted, it's C equals lambda times nu. Lambda is the wavelength, and then nu is the frequency. Um, in order to produce a graph of the absorbance of different pigments, we use a device called a spectrometer. The basis of a spectrometer is where you have a light source, which goes into a monochromatic, which splits it into these little rainbows here. <laughs> and then we expose the sample to this, these beams of light, and then you know, it absorbs different wavelengths of those colors, and it's read by the detector, and the graph prints out on the computer. So the basis of this is the light in these lamps comes from where you have an atom and with electrons. When the electrons get excited, they reach a higher energy orbital. In order to stabilize themselves down again, they need to release energy in the form of light. Um, you can measure that energy with the equation of energy equals mu times Planck's constant and then with the frequency again. Um, the colors that you are seeing, like I said on the previous slide, are actually the complementary color to what is being absorbed. So if, for an example, if you're looking at this um, diagram here, if you're seeing yellow, it's actually absorbing a violet or blue-violet pigment. And then the graph over there is an example graph. So what you're seeing here is there is a peak at 395, and usually there is a visible spectrum underneath where you can see what color is being shown. And the one that you see is the complementary color to that. Yes, where the peak is the highest on your graph because there has been the most absorbance of a particular wavelength. So our group was group three, and I'm just going to highlight a few of the specific materials that were unique to our group. We used four dimethyl amino acetophenone and four fluorobenzaldehyde, as well as a vacuum filtration system, which we will address in. So the procedure is broken up into two sections. The first section is where we actually combine the chemicals we needed to make the pigment, which would be the dimethyl amino acetophenone and then the fluorobenzaldehyde. So this is where we're combining those things. And then in this part is where we're taking this filter flask and we're hooking it up to a faucet to create suction in a filter funnel in the top of it. And the filter funnel is where we put our combined ingredients and make them we purify them. So here are the final results from all five groups. The, our group was group three, and ours is a little bit unique because we used the four flow benzaldehyde, which was a liquid form. The other groups used completely solid compounds. So we will address the graph and comparisons in a minute. Um, and then we used, like I said previously, the four dimethyl amino acetophenone. And then if you see right here, it goes from one to five. One and three are similar in the colors that they are both yellow. However, when you analyze the graph in a minute, three is a little bit brighter of a yellow. And then two 
two and five are most alike in their absorbencies, and then four is the one that they're not absorbing. So we have a hypothesis that, well, we we're basically just trying to see if there was like the difference in the specific chemicals we use generated the difference in like the color and wavelengths and stuff. So um, we found that groups one and three were the both the yellow ones. They were the most similar. We both used the dimethyl amino acetophetone, and uh, we both got the same color. But group one used chlorobenzaldehyde, which produced a slightly less intense yellow. And you can see it has a little bit less absorbency. It only goes up to 2.5 at the peak. Whereas on group three, we had a more intense yellow. And we used fluorobenzaldehyde in a liquid form. And we got a peak up to three. So I guess the more absorbance you have, the more intense your reflective color is going to be. So this is group two. And this is the red uh, compound that you saw in the picture a few minutes ago. You can see it's up here at the 1.2 with a peak at 400 in the wavelength. So if you go down here and you open the 400 range, it's more of a blue versus a blue <laughs> color. And so group two absorbed the most blue pigment, which is why it produced red, which is complementary. Group five was similar in that it had a 400 range wavelength, but it produced, it has less of the blue wavelength. It produced an orange color, which is the red down here. Um, for group four, as you can see, they're uh, way the most, well, there's a lot more absorbing in the ultraviolet spectrum, which is not visible. But as you go throughout the whole entire visible spectrum of light, you can see all the colors are minimally absorbed, which is the colorless product. So this one was white. So here are a few of our uh, STEM applications of spectroscopy. The one I'm going to highlight is the astronomical aspect of it. Uh, astronomers use the idea of spectroscopy to understand that the universe is ever-growing and ever-changing. It's a principle that they apply to understand that there is still growth. Um, and my favorite one was the criminal investigation. If you have, say, a hit and run, and the car that's left at the scene has a paint chip from the other car, they can actually take that paint chip, use spectroscopy to get specific wavelengths that are unique to that vehicle and find you know, the culprit. <laughs> so we want to acknowledge Dr. Duncan for taking his time and setting up the lab and allowing us to participate in such a unique lab and using all the equipment and providing us with the knowledge that go into it. And for helping us with one of the triple <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, wait. This is who, this is, these are our site applications. I forgot how the computer works, so. Oh, it should be, oh, there it is, okay. Coolio. So today we're going to be talking about the physics behind roller coasters as well as the physics behind optics. Um, my name is Cooper Harrison. I am from Dallas, Texas. I like throwing pottery, writing poetry, and playing guitar. I am hoping to be a chemistry major and then go on to work in metallurgy. Uh, my name is Martin Crocker. I'm from Gilbertsville, Pennsylvania. Um, my intended major is biopharmaceutical sciences, but I'm thinking of changing it to biochemistry. Um, my intended career afterwards is to become a biopharmaceutical researcher. Um, my hobbies kind of include travel, soccer, and hiking, um, while sleeping, eating, eating new people. <laughs> so we're going to begin our presentation by talking about the physics behind roller coasters. The reason that a roller coaster is fun to go on is because you experience that butterfly sensation, or Gs. You're experiencing Gs. In fact, right now, you guys are all experiencing 1G or 9.8 meters second squared. So the most Gs a person has actually withstood and not died was 46.2, and um, he was an Air Force pilot. But most of you will never experience Gs past 5Gs. This is because they don't build roller coasters that go past 5Gs. Once you reach that 5G limit, you will experience whiplash, uh, head injury, maybe if you, who knows. 9Gs, <laughs> you will most likely pass out, unless you're in the Air Force, apparently. <laughs> now, when we're talking about G's, 
it's really good when you talk about something to know how that something, we get that number. You have, to, you have to know the speed of the object, and you need to know the turn radius to find out the amount of Gs are going to be exerted onto it. So for this, we're going to use something that's actually in Dallas. It's the Texas Motor Speedways, where they have NASCAR races. races. So the turn radius on the uh, race course is 230 meters. And most um, NASCAR drivers drive around 400 kilometers per hour, which is 111.11 meters a second. So you're going to take your speed, and you're going to divide it by your turn radius. And you're going to get the great number 53.67 meters per second squared. But this is not your answer. You need to divide this by the acceleration due to gravity, which of course is 9.8. And so we're going to find that this race car driver driving on the Texas Motor Speedway track is going to be experiencing 5.47 Gs, which means he may be a little bit uncomfortable, but as long as he wins, it's all OK. <laughs> now, when they first started building roller coasters back a long time ago, um, 1900s, they tried to put circular loops in them, because who doesn't like to go in a circular loop? But they realized there were too many Gs acting upon their riders, and they would get sick, which is really bad, because then they can sue you. So they stopped building roller coasters with circles in them. Then in the 1950s, Six Flags realized they could use cloth lord loops, which have a constantly changing radius. If you remember from the past slide, you take the turn radius of something to determine the Gs. So by having a radius that is constantly changing, you're able to kind of minimize the amount of Gs acting upon you. So if you ever get the chance to build a roller coaster and you don't want to get sued by the company you build the roller coaster for, there are some things you need to remember. First off, your biggest drop must be at the beginning because this is going to give you the energy that carries you through the whole roller coaster. And this is also going to be the energy that, is, that makes centrifugal force, which keeps you from falling off the roller coaster. People don't like that either. So a little tidbit on centrifugal force. You, we all know that mass is not likely to change. We like to resist change. And so that feeling that you feel when you know Martin takes a sharp turn in his car is <laughs> centrifugal force. You want to keep going straight, but Martin's like, oh, we're going this way. <laughs> and the last thing is circle loops are no good. You're going to have too many Gs acting upon you, and no one's going to have fun. You need to use cloth forward loops. So now we're going to segue into the physics of optics. So during our physics lab, we learned about optics. There's actually three areas of optics. There's physical, geometrical, and quantum optics. Physical optics is when light is perceived as a wave, and geometrical optics is when light is perceived as a ray, um, like from your phone, from your laptop, tablet, or even from this projector. Uh, quantum optics is when light is viewed as a particle, um, which involves photons. Uh, we also learned about how uh, light reflects. Reflection occurs when light bounces off of a surface. There's two types. There's diffuse and there's specular reflection. Diffuse reflection is when light reflects off a rough surface, such as a wet road or a side view mirror on a car. And specular reflection occurs off of a shiny surface, such as a bathroom mirror. The uh, equation for mirrors is 1 over the distance to the object plus 1 over the distance to the image equals 1 over the focal point. And refraction um, is the movement of light from one medium into another medium. So if you think about a straw in a glass of water, um, above the water, the straw is going one direction, and then if you look below the water, the straw changes directions. This is because when the light hits it, it changes the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, um, because it's going from a faster medium to a slower medium. The equation for refraction is the speed of light in the vacuum over the speed of the light in the medium equals n. So I'm going to go over magnification. So last week, we got the chance to go outside and set some leaves on fire. We did not use lighters, though. We used magnifying devices. I wouldn't say glass because they weren't glass. But so what we did is we um, utilized the sun. And for this equation, it's going to be the height of the image divided by the height of the sun. I'll explain that first. So when you take a magnifying glass outside and you try to make a fire, you're going to notice a tiny little dot of yellow or white. That is actually your focal point. This is where all your heat is. But, and that is the height of your image. And the height of your object is, of course, the sun. So what a magnifying glass allows you to do is it allows you to focus all that, all that energy into a smaller force and then use the energy to transfer it. So engineering kind of, kind of connects to all this, especially with roller coasters. You really want a safe roller coaster. It just makes people stay better. So some real world applications um, would be engineers and law enforcement. Engineers use physics to create safe coasters, cars, machineries, and other devices. 
Um, they also use the formulas in physics for designing concepts, and they also use physics in the alteration of light display in headlights. And law enforcement also uses optics in police radars to catch speeding cars and determine how fast they're going. So we would first like to thank the National Science Foundation. If it was not for the National Science Foundation, we would not be here. We would not be presenting, and we would be not talking about the wonderful world of physics. Um, so we just want to thank them for their, uh, the generosity of their grant and allowing us to get that uh, the boost we need to have a good start off in college. We'd also like to thank Mrs. Guirino for uh, allowing us to use her lab and teaching us about her physics classes and how they work. Um, we also like to make a uh, huge thanks to Dr. Siopsis and Dr. Gibson for not only creating the program, but allowing us to do this every single year and continue the program and making the grants for it. Um, we'd also like to thank Lindsay Walton for helping us every step of the way and kind of keeping us on track every single night, even if it was till 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd also like to thank the peer mentors. Um, they've kind of been with us even when they didn't need to be. Uh, <laughs> well, some of them. A lot of them had other things that they were doing outside of the program as well, so it was a lot more tough for them to focus on two different things, but they managed to help us and stay with us and work with us and keep us on track as well. And then we have three pages of sources. You know, you can never have too many sources. Um, so, uh, and are there any questions about row filter or optics in the crowd? Going once, going twice, sold. Um, I just want to close by, again, thanking all of you for being here and supporting these students. I'm seeing a lot of our Scott Science Scholars from previous years, and that makes me very happy. Thanks to the faculty. You guys, you did it. You're done with SQ. Well, you're never done with SQ, but you're done with the summer, right? This is great. Again, I want to just say from Dr. Gibson and I how much we have enjoyed uh, having you be part of this and cooperating with us and generally keeping anything we didn't need to know about away from us. That was really <laughs> nice. Um, peer mentors, too. And I just want to say to you guys, you know, I was listening to um, Nadia and Josh talking about the bacteria, and I was thinking, this is kind of what we did to you, right? We, we, we got you here, and then we, we, didn't, we didn't modify your DNA, I promise. <laughs> but, but, right, we shocked you a little bit, maybe a little shock. There was some heat involved when we were outside. Um, and hopefully, you know, you've, you've made a small transformation that's going to lead to this large transformation that we hope will be Maryville College for you. Um, and I, again, I just want to say thank you, and I want you to know that th these are your folks. So you're going to go out now. Tomorrow is the first day of class. Usually we have a little break. I know. Uh, tomorrow's the first day of class, and it, you know, the first day is going to be all right. The whole thing is going to be all right, but there are going to be moments where it feels like it's not going to be all right. <laughs> Look around this room right now, because these are your folks. When it doesn't feel all right, these are your people. The ones that you went through the summer with, the peer mentors, and all these other guys who are here supporting you today. So thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day at classes tomorrow. Thank you.